right, Isaiah 54. Don't be alarmed that on the screen it says Isaiah 54 and 55. 55 is for next week. Although we will just barely get into that chapter today. 54 is short per. <laughs> We're going to make it short, I guess we'll say. I actually was going to skip 54. There's a lot of debate. We've been doing this series on the songs of the servant, the servants of God out of Isaiah, and there's debate over the, whether there's four or five songs, whether 54 is a song of the servant or not. Uh, I believe it is. Um, and I was going to skip it because in a sense it doesn't seem very relevant for us. It's written to the people of Israel. It's a song sung to Israel about the promises of their future kingdom, although there's lots of debate. If you, read, you can read uh, 20 theological uh, journals on this or commentaries, and you're going to get about seven different opinions. I'll give you the right opinion today. Don't worry. And uh, I believe it's written to not a people just returning from exile. That's what a lot of people say. It's from the Babylonian captivity and Israel's coming back and they're going to take over the promised land. I want you to pay attention though. I don't think that's the case. And the reason I don't think that's the case is read the language. The language that's being used to describe this, this land and the blessings of God to the people of the land, they're eternal blessings. They're not temporary. They're not just for a little group of people. They're, they're large long-scale blessings that are given, and I think you'll see that in the language. But we spent the time really looking through these servant songs, songs of the servant. We started actually in the New Testament in Philippians 2 as we looked at the great servant um, and the fulfillment, the servant who's the fulfillment of all these promises from Isaiah. Then we went to Isaiah 42, and we read through the song of the call, the call of the servant by God to come and do this miraculous thing that would provide an incredible redemption and then we learned of that redemption the mission of the servant in Isaiah 49 where the the servant is asked to leave his the comforts of his eternal home and go make his dwelling with man and then we read Isaiah 50 which is the commitment of the servant and the the, the one of my favorite ones because the servant is just resolved it doesn't matter what the, the calling is. He will do it. In fact, in the eyes of the servant, the task that's been given to him by God is as good as done. It's finished. And then we finally went to Isaiah 52 and 53, which is the most famous of the songs, the song of the suffering servant, where we read of the brutal torture and mistreatment of the servant who came to provide redemption for the world and the world rejected and turned away. And yet in spite of that, the servant arose victorious. And he provided redemption for a people who did not want it, but needed it. And today we arrive at 54, the success. And it's only because of Isaiah 52 and 53 that we can reach this point. Because of the suffering and the offering of atonement, eternal, complete atonement on our behalf, that we can even arrive at the success of the servant. And as I said earlier, Isaiah 54 is really the success for the people of Israel, for the Jews. It's their success. And we're going to see that success in, and it's really, we could say, in the fulfillment of the covenant that was made to King David, made to Abraham, made to Isaac, to Jacob, to Israel, to David, and that's the covenant that's being spoken of. And so we see the success here, and it's a, a abounding, uh, incredible blessings to the nation of Israel. We could call this, uh, Isaiah 54, this song, we could call it the joy of the Lord, and it's found in who the servant is. And so we're going to experience this joy uh, today, as we read through the blessings that the, the servant provides or gives to the nation of Israel. And do not worry, where, there's an incredible application for us. In fact, that's part of the reason I was almost going to skip it, is because there doesn't seem to be lots of application for us. And yet, there's incredible application for you and I as we read through this. So, let's just do it in sections. I'm going to ask you if you'd read Isaiah 54, verse 1 through 3 with me to start. 
Sing, O barren, you who have not borne. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with children. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married women, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall expand to the right and to the left and your descendants will inherit the nations and make desolate cities inhabited. Now this is, <laughs> this is figurative language. And, and what's being just described there is bizarre to us. It, it was the woman's job to set up a tent when traveling. And, uh, and so the command is here, sing you women uh, who are now setting up your tent, but expand your tents because you're going to be blessed. And the blessing here, it's, it's kind of funny, but it's a good blessing. It's children. It's a population boom. There's this call to joy immediately. And, and Israel's not mentioned, but that's who it's for. The, these are the recipients. This nation that has struggled for so long to survive, this nation that's been small and oppressed and attacked and taken captive and released and taken captive and released, are finally going to experience the freedom in God, the freedom that the servant provides. And so the command is, go out and set up your tents and establish your stakes deep in the ground. And when you bind the corners of the tent, leave lots of room because children are going to be bursting out of this tent. Kind of a goofy picture. But it's a picture, a great picture of blessing. Children are a heritage of the Lord. We know that. And yet here this nation that's been oppressed and mistreated for so long is now going to experience the numerous offspring of God's blessings. The people have suffered and now they're going to experience immediate population growth. And so the tent bursts. And the language is one of abounding growth. In fact, verse 1, we see the word numerous. Verse 2, the words enlarge, stretch out, lengthen, strengthen. Verse 3, the word expand. Now, the purpose of this description uh, of this population explosion is the goodness of God. God is going to bless the nation like he has never blessed them before. Now, let me ask you, does that sound, um, does that sound applicable to Israel right now? I mean, you look at the nation, are they still suffering extreme oppression? I would say so. They're struggling the population has grown immensely the last few decades, but is it, is it bursting at the seams in this way? I don't think so. And yet, here this time is described as a time of extreme goodness of God that will be experienced by the people. The purpose is to, to cause the people to praise the Lord. And that's the purpose for you and I. God's abundant kindness deserves to be known by many people around us. And so God wants to show His kindness. He wants to show His grace. He wants to show His goodness to many people. And He desires to make His name, ma name known and felt by people. And so I ask you today, if you know God as your Savior, how well are you expressing the goodness of God to those around you? How often are you praising the goodness of, of God with great joy for His experienced blessings? In fact, how have you experienced the kindness of God lately? And then who have you told about that? And so he, he calls the nation back to himself, and then he's going to bless them, and they're going to grow. Verse 4, the, the blessings continue, and they, the people experience just a generous kindness from God. There's great descriptors that are used here, although they're, they're rather vague in, in use. They're not specific. Uh, verse 4 says, Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame, for you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your Maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is His name, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife who has been refused, says your God. For a mere moment, 
I have forsaken you. With a, but with great mercies, I gather you. With a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you, nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. Now I realize the figurative language is continuing here, but the interpretation should be literal. God's goodness is literally felt and known by us. And he uses some illustrations here to, to, to try and explain this to us. We, we have experienced, and Israel, who he's speaking of, has experienced God's goodness, but will experience it even more. We can take confidence in who God is confidence in his care for us he says in verse 4 there's nothing to fear do not fear for you will not be ashamed neither be disgraced for you will not be put to shame for you will forget the shame of your youth you know sometimes fear can grip our hearts it destroys our trust and it leaves us with little hope fear really destroys and eats away at our faith and our confidence in god and yet here he says, there's, you have nothing to fear. You're, you're perfectly within my care and my control. And now our natural response is, but, but there's times where I don't feel that way and I don't experience that. There's times as if it seems God is far away or, or maybe that God has even forgotten about me. And he addresses that. But fear holds us and grips our heart. The unknown sometimes, the past, the discomfort that holds us hostage. But God is always faithful. And He will not allow us to endure endless pain. In fact, before He addresses that, and the, the issues, the, the kind of the excuses or the accusations that we're tempted to to fire at him that he's forgotten us, he reminds us of his very character in verse 5. In fact, there's five names that are used of God that he uses to describe himself to us. There's really nothing for us to be ashamed of when God is with us. So verse 5, he says, the Almighty Lord who is full of authority. Verse 5, for your maker is your husband. Your, your maker, in other words, your creator is the one who has called you to be united with him. Just like a, a husband and a wife are united as one, just like a husband should care and, and protect and provide for his wife, God has done that. He's called us to himself and aligned us with himself, and he is the one. Our maker is our protector. Our maker is our provider. He's called the Lord of hosts here. The, the one who rules over all beings, all created beings. The Redeemer, this is the one who is responsible for your redemption, for your well-being. He calls himself the Holy One of Israel, the one who flawlessly keeps his obligations that he made to the nation of Israel. In other words, this is our covenant-keeping God. He made a covenant to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and to Israel, to, to Moses, to David. He made that covenant and he keeps every single part of that agreement. That's the Holy One of Israel. And to top it off, he is the God of the whole earth, the Almighty Lord of all. That's the one who makes these promises to us. That's the one who provides care, not just to us, but specifically in this chapter, to the nation of Israel. And so we see the tender care of God in verse 6 through 8. For the Lord has called you. This calling, the word call there, is a personal invitation. It's by name. God individually calls us by our name. He addresses us. And what's the address concerning? He's called us like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit. Like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your God. So he calls us in the moment of our need. He seeks and he saves the lost, the hurting, 
the vulnerable, the broken, the abandoned, these people who thought that they were forgotten and useless, and yet Christ came and He calls them by name and He joins with them as their Maker and He provides for them because of His goodness. And so the Lord brings mercy to them. The Lord brings everlasting kindness. And these momentary struggles that we experience in in life pale in comparison to the bountiful goodness of God for all of eternity. That's what he's saying. There's this moment in time where we feel forgotten or we feel abandoned and we ask, even sometimes, we, we even ask God or accuse God of leaving us and abandoning us. We feel alone and broken. And let me tell you, God is not diminished by those accusations. I don't think that's a bad thing that you shake your fist even at times and, and, and accuse God of abandoning you. I mean, that's bad because you have a bad view of God, but God isn't hurt by that. By you saying those things, God doesn't get a little bit smaller. No, no, no. He's eternal Lord of all. And the fact that you are willing to admit that and at times even cry out to God or confess your need for God or confess your abandonment, the fact that you feel alone and broken is a good thing. God is waiting to hear that from you. Because your pain and the trouble that you feel is but for a short, short moment. Now to us, it seems like a long time. When you're going through a hardship, maybe a couple of weeks, or a few months, or maybe even a few years. We feel like time is so slow, and the pain seems so deep. And yet, in light of eternity, it is but for a a short moment that we're experiencing. We're not that old. Amen? Yeah, all right. Let me tell you something. You might feel old, and you might look old, to us. But in reality, you're not old. What, what are we here on this earth for? 50, 60, 70 years? And compared to eternity, that is just a short amount of time. And, and the struggles that we have in our life sometimes, even if they seem long to us, maybe they are long. Maybe they last a couple years in comparison to eternity. That is very, very short. And that's what, what God is saying here. For a mere moment, I have forsaken you, or it appears that I have forsaken you. But with great mercies, I will gather you. And the idea is gather you back to myself. With a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. And so we have these times in our life that are difficult and they're hard, but they're just a short moment of time. And then he gives us an example. It it seems odd, but the example of Noah. Noah endured hardship. However you want to to quantify it, he built the ark, took him a long time to build the ark. The rains fell for 40 days and 40 nights, and he stuck on this ark with the animals for about a year. That, That to us, a year of tribulation, a year of difficult living, that's a big deal. And yet God says at the end of this, He promises to to Noah never to flood the earth again. In fact, He gives him incredible promises. In verse 9, He says that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you, for the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not, never depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed says the Lord who has mercy on you. You're going to see the word mercy over and over and over again in this chapter because God is a merciful God and and there's moments in our life where we feel abandoned or we feel lost or we feel alone and yet the, the permanent kindness and the permanent peace, the permanent mercy of God can be known. And so Noah stands as an example of a person who went through hardship but it was just for a short period of time. And God blessed him. And the mercy of God was felt fully in his life. And the same is true of us. Same is true of Israel. The the people of Israel are an extremely resilient people. And that's how Christians should be too. Resilient. Strong in our confidence of who God is. 
God goes on and tells them they'll experience the future glory of, of a kingdom. And this is where I think the language gets very descriptive, not of a temporary uh, land or, or a, a pulling people back from exile, a Babylonian exile and giving them a land in, in the Middle East where they can have. It's more than that. And, and you'll see that in the description. So read with me verse, uh, verse 11. O you afflicted one, tossed with tempest, and not comforted. Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. Indeed, they shall surely assemble, but not because of me. Whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. And so the nation will experience the promise of a glorious kingdom. Now, I don't know if you are familiar with the description of New Jerusalem in, in the gospel. Or the gospel. I can call it the gospel. The gospel of Revelation. <laughs> it's usually not called the gospel. The book of Revelation gives this great description of, of eternity and what heaven will look like. And this new city, new Jerusalem, will come down and rest upon the earth. This kingdom of God. And as we read the verses of verse 11 and verse 12, it sounds strikingly similar to the description of New Jerusalem in Revelation. The foundations are made of precious jewels. It's glorious. It's brilliant in its appearance. And who is the one who's instructing the children? Who's the teacher of the children in this kingdom, this place? The Lord Himself. God is the one teaching the people. That's why I say I don't think this is just a return from exile. This description is a place where God is in full authority. He sits on the throne. He's being worshipped. He's ruling. He's the one instructing people in truth and righteousness. And so here they experience the blessing of peace and confidence. I mean, wouldn't you want to sit under the teachings of Jesus directly? I do. This sounds a lot better than our church. No offense to any of you. I'm not offended either. You can shake your head and yes, I would much rather have Jesus teaching me than you, Pastor. Good! You should! This is a wonderful place of peace. It's also a place of confidence. Right? There's enemies still. This is why I believe it's the kingdom. There's still enemies. There's still people who want him free from terror. He's the one that allows the evil to assemble but crushes them. That sounds like the kingdom of the servant. And so they experience the protection and the defense of God. In fact, some rich theology here. Verse 15, they assemble against, but not because of me. They assemble to, to attack the people. And yet what happens, verse 16, God here says, Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the spoiler to destroy. In other words, God is saying, I have created and allowed people to turn from me and rebel, and I've allowed them to assemble against you. I allow people. He's allowing evil to persist. I'm not saying he created evil. He's allowing it to persist. And he's allowing the discomforts of life. Because when the discomforts and the attacks of life come, the servant rises up and defends. And His truth is known. And His goodness is known. And His mercy is known. Let's be honest. Let's put the application back on us. If life was just rosy and perfect all the time and easy, it would really diminish our ability to live and honor and glorify Christ. If everything was just easy all the time and you never had anything, nothing that you ever worried about, nothing bad ever happened, Everything was just, I'll say this, vanilla, right? There's never any hardships, no ups and downs. Now, listen, if you're in a time of trouble right now, you're like, no, that sounds pretty good. I'd like that. 
But after we get through a time of, uh, of intensity, a time of difficulty, a time of struggle, and we, ar- we arrive through that victoriously through Christ, doesn't that build your confidence and your faith and your ability to praise God? Because you recognize how good God has been. In the moment, it's hard. I mean, that's true for me. I know that's true for you. When we get through, when we finally arrive on the other side of difficulty, it is so much easier to praise God. And we praise God with such more depth than we did before we ever entered a hardship. The the trials and the tribulations of life actually make life and victory and faith in Christ more glorious in the end. And that's kind of what he's saying here. He says, you're going you're to be attacked and you're going to go through difficulty, but I will arrive and I will set up this kingdom and I will give you peace and safety and comfort. And when people come to attack, I will defend you. And you will see my goodness and you'll see my mercy. The glory of the freedom and the defense and the protection of God. And God will make the people a heritage of of righteousness. Now listen, these blessings of God, they're wonderful, and they're complete in the people of Israel. They're not to be ignored, they're not to be belittled, they're not to be forgotten. These these promises here are for the people of Israel, a special people that God has loved for centuries and still loves today. They cannot be replaced as a nation. They can only be added to. And so with that thought in mind, I want to go into Isaiah 55 because here God adds to the blessings of Israel by extending his loving kindness to another people group. Isaiah 55 is not a servant song. I would call it the epilogue. Isaiah 40 to 55 is one section and it contains the servant songs and it's all about God and his goodness and the establishment of of salvation through the servant. And, and Isaiah 55 is that epilogue, this, this song, it's a song, but not the song of a servant. It's the song of praise to the Lord. And the subject of this, this song, this chapter, are the people of God's kingdom. And so we've studied the individual servant songs. We've studied the fact that Israel are part of that kingdom. And Isaiah 55, now we come to what's called the hymn of triumphant joy. And we're just going to read verses 1 through 3 and be done. I want you to read these words. And if you have good New Testament knowledge, you're going to see how familiar these words are over and over again. And so it starts with an invitation. Ho! Or attention! Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money on what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you the sure mercies of David. And so this invitation is extended. And it's extended to people who are in peril. People who are in need. We see that because they're hungry and they're thirsty in verse 1. And the hunger and thirst in in the Bible represents weariness and discontentedness or discomfort, struggles in life. And at first people applied this just to the Jews. But we're going to see in Isaiah 55... It's extended to the Gentiles. And so the people are not just physically hungry or thirsty. This is a spiritual emptiness inside of people. Let me ask you today, as you're sitting here, have you been experiencing a spiritual emptiness? Something is missing. You're discontent. You're parched. I encourage you to listen carefully to the words of Isaiah 55. These people who are hungry, thirsty, longing for more, 
nothing is quenching their thirst. The invitation is extended. And let me tell you, the invitation is only extended because of Isaiah 52, verse 13, through Isaiah 53, verse 12. The suffering servant. The suffering servant of Isaiah 53 is the reason we can hear these words. The reason the invitation can be given. The reason there is a, a quenching of this spiritual thirst that we have and a, 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 a nourishment for the hunger, the pain that, that yearns inside of us needing more. It is only because of the servant we have these things. And so we have God's provision spoken of here in these three verses. It is a verse of imperative, command. Look, look at all the commands. Almost every single phrase in these three chapters is a command. He, he says in verse 1, Ho, or attention. Give me your attention. Come, buy, eat. Come, buy. Verse 2, listen. Verse 3, incline your ear. Come, hear. There's this plea that's being offered. Please accept the goodness of God. In fact, he says, come and buy without money. There's no prices on the, the goodness of God. And the reason is because the price has already been paid. Christ paid it. Everything he has to offer to you is free. Just come and take it. And yet, what is our response? We say, no, I want to earn it. I want to pay. And I want to pay for things that have no price. And I want to pay for things that don't satisfy. That's what he's saying here. Come to the waters. You who have no money, nothing to offer, come and buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk. That, that represents, not, this is not just bread and water. This is the good stuff. The blessings that flow from an abundance. Why do you spend your money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? If there's not a question that should ring in the heart of every man, woman, and child in this world is why do we consistently seek things that bring no satisfaction? Oh, we, we seek things that bring us a little bit of happiness for a moment. And then we go back on Amazon to look for more. Right? These things don't bring satisfaction. A servant brings satisfaction and you have nothing to offer him to receive his goodness. He gives it freely. That's Isaiah 55. There's this plea, in fact, to accept God's goodness. God supplies everything. Come and buy without money. You have no value, nothing to give. God's gracious goodness supplies everything. As I said, if you know the New Testament, then this sounds very familiar. John chapter 6, verse 35 says, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. John seven thirty-seven. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Revelation 21, verse 6, And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. Revelation twenty two seventeen. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. As I've said many times, the servant of the servant songs of Isaiah is Jesus Christ. And he says, come. Just like Isaiah 55, where it's prophesied that he would call people to himself to come experience his goodness and the grace that he offers freely, he continues to call us. Contrast that with the wastefulness of verse 2 where we pursue things that have no eternal value, that bring just a, a temporary moment of happiness and then it flies away. Christ offers complete freedom, complete quenching of the spiritual thirst that we have. 
and there's nothing you can do to buy it. In fact, he gives us the final command to listen. Listen carefully to me, is what he's saying. He starts with that in verse, verse 1. Ho, attention, everyone who thirsts. And then he says in verse 3, incline your ear or listen carefully to me and come to me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. And so the call by God is made. He calls the invitation. And it's, again, it's a personal invitation. Here, I'm calling you by name to listen to me. Come and experience the goodness that only God provides. And what's it based on? He closes verse 3 by saying, the sure mercies of David. Now we see that and we think, oh, the sure mercies of David. He's talking to Israel again. Okay, he's talking to... No, this is the sure mercies of who would come through David. This is the covenant that God made with David. And what's the mercy of... The part of the covenant that God makes with David concerning mercy, it is that his descendants would sit upon an eternal throne because he would provide redemption not just for Israel, but for the whole world. So it's talking about the covenant, the promise that God made. This is the covenant of Jesus Christ. Redemption through the Savior and the Savior alone. That's the sure mercies of David. God is the Redeemer. God redeemed this insignificant shepherd boy who had no purpose in life, right? You think about David. Not even his dad thought he was worthy to be at the meeting about the future king. All the other brothers are there, but David, leave him in the field. He's nobody. And yet God calls this, this insignificant little shepherd boy and provides him eternal mercy. And that's what God does for us. Sometimes we feel insignificant, we feel unimportant, and yet God provides mercy on an individual basis because He knows you and He's called you by name. Hear. Incline your ear. Listen. Then God says, come to me. And lastly, He says, take it. Receive it. That's what he's saying. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of God. God makes the covenant. He offers the covenant. All you have to do is receive it. There's no work of righteousness that we can do. Again, in the New Testament, God says in Matthew 11:28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And again, in Acts 13, 34, he raised, and that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, thus has, he has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Are you living today with the confidence of the sure mercies of King Jesus? Are you confident in the eternal Lord of Isaiah 54, verse 5, the Lord of all who offers this to you freely through His servant. He's tenderly inviting you to experience His goodness. And if you're here today and you've never experienced the goodness of God that has quenched your thirst and calmed the hunger, the spiritual hunger that you have, I plead with you, do not leave today. Listen to the voice of God calling you. And for the rest of us, who are you sharing the sure mercies of God with? We are called, and we should easily speak freely of the goodness of our Lord and our Maker. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, your love to us. We did nothing to deserve this, nothing to deserve. We were rebellious arrogant. We shook our fists at You. We have complained against You that You have forgotten us or forsaken us and nothing could be farther from the truth. You have loved us with a love that, that is beyond anything we could ever experience on this world because Your mercies 
are sure and they are new every morning. I pray, Lord, that we would with great confidence speak of You, our Maker, the One who is in control and keeps every promise that He has ever made. Lord, if there's someone here today who does not know You as their Savior, Oh, maybe they know you intellectually and they've read scriptures and they know what the Bible says about you. Lord, today I would I pray that they would come and take from you the free gift of salvation that you're offering. May they humble themselves and admit there's nothing they could do. They could never earn their salvation. That they are a sinner who deserves hell and yet in spite of that, you are good to them that they would cry out for the forgiveness that you offered in Isaiah 53, that you offered on the cross when you died for their sins. I pray, Lord, today they would experience that forgiveness. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for this day that we can set aside even, uh, not just a Sunday, but a Sunday in which we can focus on your goodness and give thanks to your name. And I pray we would continue to do that throughout the day. We pray this in Christ's precious name. Amen. We're going to sing 384, To Whom Much Has Been Given. If you would take your blue...